Welcome to the studio of the European Parliament in Brussels. We are here in the studio, but just a few minutes ago, there have been a lot of uh, a great number of uh, the member the members of the European Parliament and staff members of the Parliament outside this building uh, protesting against the Russian invasion in Ukraine and expressing their solidarity to the Ukraine people. This year group in the Parliament, uh, which hosts this discussion and organized it, uh, has, uh, has been very, very, very clear on these topics. From the very beginning, ECR Group is uh, for sovereignty of people, nations and countries. Again, good afternoon. Welcome to the studio of the European Parliament in Brussels, in Brussels, which is a host of the discussion organized by the ECR group in the Parliament, a discussion named Europe is a civilizational choice. Today's discussion is a part of a bigger campaign of the ECR, which, is, which has started in December 2020 in Warsaw and reached Sofia, Zagreb, Bucharest, The Hague, Stockholm, Vilnius and Madrid in 2021. Now it's time to talk about uh, Europe's future regarding the cooperation with our neighbours. For that purpose, the ECR is creating the initiative to engage experts and partners in our neighbourhood to discuss about the future in two events during March uh, 2022. The one today and tomorrow will uh, verse on uh, the Eastern Partnership and uh, later on this, mar uh, this month, uh, on 29th and 30th uh, of March, we will talk about the Western Balkans. ECR believe the future of Europe is uh, not only the future of the European Union itself, but future of uh, the whole Europe, including Eastern Partnership. This discussion is uh, particularly re relevant now in the context of the war in Ukraine and in the context of the Kiev's call for an urgent special procedure to, for EU accession. I'm Milena Milutinova, Brussels One uh, show host uh, on Bulgaria on Air TV, and uh, I will moderate this discussion. Now I give the floor to MEP Zdzislav Krasnodiebski, President of the ECR Institutional Policy Working Group, to open the discussion. Mr. Krasnodiebski, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being with us today to discuss Europe's future in this crucial and very dramatic moment of our con continent. Uh, and our continent is going through this uh, in recent days, what actually nobody expected. Uh, um, I am sure that the European public, uh, following our campaign Europe's future and new hope, is already familiar with our vision of the future of Europe. Secure borders, safe uh, citizens, sovereign member states, realistic climate protection, doing less, doing better. Uh, some of our main watchwords we want now to promote also in the countries aspiring uh, into EU membership or closer integration with the European Union, like those from Eastern Partnership region. We also used to this opportunity to show to the members of European Union that Europe is not only limited to the EU, nor should be these two terms treated as synonymous. With the dramatic event going on this very moment in Ukraine, our approach finds in detailed confirmation um, in reality. The future of Europe uh, is currently at stake not only in Berlin, Paris, or Brussels, it is today much more at the stake and outskirts of Kiev on the streets of Donetsk or Kharkiv, and in so many other cities, towns and villages all across Ukraine. 
Our event was supposed to discuss long-term prospect of the EU integration of the region, but the events of the last days accelerated the course of history to the extent that it still remains difficult to predict. We should nevertheless remain ready for new possible scenarios, including much more quicker EU accession of some countries than in, had uh, been widely believed before the open and brutal Russian aggression on the Ukraine neighbor. And I must say that ACR always uh, supported this uh, integration. Today and tomorrow, we will discuss Europe as fundamental choice of civilization from the eastern neighbors of the EU. Recognize expert, experienced decision makers from the Eastern European Eastern Partnership region. Together with our MEPs, we'll try to answer the questions related to the current state of play and possible future developments, mostly in Ukraine, but also in Belarus, Moldavia, Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. We will have two uh, panel discussions. The first one trying to carry out a general assessment of the EU policies in the region in the recent years and their influence on solving the existing problems there. And the second panel will address a broad question of long-term impact of the ongoing processes on the integration of the eastern neighborhood countries with the EU. Overall, the speaker will try to define the role that the Eastern Partnership countries are supposed to, to and will play for and in the future of Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Krasnodiebski. Uh, now let me introduce you my uh, guests uh, in the studio. Uh, Professor uh, Richard Legutko, co-chairman of the ECR Group, and uh, our keynote speakers, uh, uh, Mr. Georgi Barbamidze, Baramidze, uh, former Vice Prime Minister of Georgia and State Minister for Euro-Atlantic Integration between 2004 and 2012. He's uh, on a remote connection. Uh, and uh, Ms. Anna Futiga, MEP, Member of the European Parliament, ECR Group, ECR co Coordinator of the European Parliament Foreign Affairs Committee and former Minister of foreign affairs in Poland. Welcome to, to our studio. Now, uh, let me give the floor to Mr. Legutko for his opening words, and uh, then I will include in our conversation the other speakers. Mr. Legutko. Thank you so much. Uh, well, we talk about uh, United Europe, but Europe is, of course, also divided, and there are many divisions uh, uh, in Europe, in Europe and the EU. One of, of uh, divisions is between West and East, and the Eastern countries were joining the EU as junior partners, so to speak, or apprentices. It was the role uh, uh, they chose, in a way, but at the same time was given to them. Uh, and it was also embodied in the existing procedure, for instance, in the voting system in the Council. And the system adopted in Lisbon decreased the voting power of Eastern Europe when compared to the Nice uh, uh, system functioning earlier. But this is just an example. Uh, but uh, I think that the time of apprenticeship is long past. And a lot should change, and a lot uh, will change, also in view of the crisis of the political leadership of the, uh, the Western countries. The recent de developments in, in, in Ukraine and, and Russia have proved beyond doubt that this leadership has failed. And it also failed because our Western partners did not sufficiently take into account our position, our East Europeans, also from outside the EU, and downplayed Russian imperialism. I think the time has come when the East uh, should have more to say and will have more to say. And this is uh, uh, actually the ECR uh, uh, position. And the ECR managed to form a good alliance between West and East, between those parties from Western Europe uh, and the like-minded parties from Eastern Europe, an alliance of close 
cooperation, but not centralization. With a centralized Europe, the, the eastern wing of Europe, again, Europe, not only the European Union, will have less and less to say, and, and the western wing more and more. And it is in our interest that, that, that we have the EU as a family of nation states, not as a super state. And again, let me repeat, this is our position, the position of the ECR. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Elgutko. Uh, we'll come back to you, uh, but uh, let us uh, include in uh, our conversation uh, uh, Mr. Baramidze, uh, because he's traveling from uh, Poland to Ukraine. Is that right, uh, Mr. Baramidze? Are you hearing us? There's no good connection in the moment. Uh, <coughs> let's uh, let's try to improve the connection. In the meantime, uh, Mr. Legutko, what what uh, uh, can the ECR group in the Parliament can do uh, about all these uh, things you, you described uh, just now? Uh, well, we've been uh, we've been very active. For one thing, we've uh, launched this uh, multi-layer conference uh, about the new. Uh, arrangement in Europe and we also have been very active in uh, our friends from the east outside uh, the, the European Union our friends from from Ukraine right from uh, uh, from uh, uh, Georgia and I think it is in a vital uh, interest that uh, these uh, uh, links should be revitalized and uh, uh, and our, our friends will be more involved uh, in what is going on in Europe. Mind you, the, the, the conflict in Europe nowadays is not only between uh, uh, those who want uh, the EU as a super state and those who want to have the EU as a family of nation states, but also is a cultural conflict. And uh, the con cultural conflict between uh, uh, li liberals and conservatives, uh, between uh, uh, Christians and not Christians, uh, between those who are faithful to uh, Western traditions and those who, for whom the uh, Europe started in uh, 1968, and so on and so on. So th these are the, the problems that we are facing. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Legutko. Uh, let's use uh, the moment uh, we have a good connection with uh, Mr. Baramidze. Uh, can you hear us, uh, Mr. Baramidze? Yes, I do. Yes, uh, I do. Hi. Welcome to our program. Please tell us, uh, where are you now? You're traveling uh, with a bus, as we can see. Yes. Yes, I'm in the bus on my way from uh, a Polish border to the Lviv. And um, I have evacuated uh, children from Krakow airport. Thank you for Polish government doing everything for helping Ukrainian uh, refugees. Thank you for talking about our European future. It's so acute issue. So, and um, I, as a former minister and uh, former defense minister uh, and the Georgian uh, private citizen, felt obliged to be um, together with my Ukrainian friends. Uh, we are today, I believe, um, I'm expressing everybody's feelings today. We are all e Ukrainians. Today, uh, future of uh, Europe and especially uh, uh, Eastern, e Eastern European flank of uh, Europe, Eastern Europe is uh, being decided um, uh, in uh, Ukraine. And I think not only European future, but uh, entire world uh, you know, civilized order. Now we are facing brutal aggression again of the Putin's Russia, uh, starting uh, not from Putin, but uh, from even Yeltsin's time, 1992-93, Georgia, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, then. And then after... Uh, uh, Putin came in power and with Medvedev in 2008. We all remember what happened in Georgia. Absolutely same scenario. Uh, Putin um, uh, 
try this time to repeat with um, uh, its uh, preparation of soft power uh, using this propaganda, these uh, all uh, methods that tested, uh, that been tested uh, by Putin in Georgia. And unfortunately then, in spite of warnings of President Saakashvili and uh, our government and many of you, in, uh, including uh, uh, Minister Fotiga, we, we know uh, many of you were say, telling other European leaders that uh, we need to react in order to not to get a uh, worse situation. Unfortunately, uh, uh, Collective West did not react uh, properly, uh, did not react in a way that it was necessary to protect um, uh, Europe's uh, security. And uh, uh, in 2008, uh, we had Bucharest summit in NATO when it was a big failure of the leadership of uh, uh, Western countries, unfortunately, as you well know. And uh, it was like a mm, very controversial decision from one hand uh, giving Ukraine and Georgia um, affirmative guarantee that we will be member of NATO, but uh, another hand not giving us a chance to um, prepare for this and membership action plan. Uh, for, and also um, uh, when, when uh, I, as a, one of the negotiator of the uh, association agreement with the European Union uh, on, on behalf of Georgia, we were not gi given, uh, together with Ukraine and Moldova, even the perspective to be uh, one day in European Union. So this was a yet a, a, another uh, mistake of European Union. Uh, we are Europeans. Nobody is doubting this. But uh, for some reason, uh, uh, then European leaders didn't let us to acknowledge in the uh, um, agreement that we are Europeans and we have a full-fledged right to uh, submit uh, to the uh, membership and uh, uh, we might have a perspective, even perspective, we talked about perspective. Even uh, about this, this was, uh, this was a kind of problem. And all these uh, um, um, uh, things happened uh, because some leaders wanted to uh, constantly look not to the eyes of the people, not to the eyes of the uh, sovereign nations, but to the eyes of the Putin. And uh, acting not uh, according to the principles and uh, our common European values, but according to the uh, uh, fear, what fear were uh, dictating them. But as we know, if you are, uh, uh, let's say, in, the, in these uh, circumstances, when you fear everything, the, the worst things will happen to you. You need to be strong, you need to be wise, you need, you need to have a leadership in order to lead your countries. And Mr. in order Baramidze, to not what, to let... What exactly uh, do you expect now from the European Union and European leaders? If you uh, uh, can be more specific. I welcome today's discussions, though I was in the bus, uh, I was watching, uh, uh, watching uh, discussions in the European Parliament. I very much welcome this atmosphere, what was there, uh, at least this time. And uh, certainly, uh, President Zelensky's appeal to uh, make Ukraine as soon as possible a uh, member of European Union must be uh, satisfied uh, as quick as possible, first. Second, I welcome strongly European Union uh, supported Ukraine with the weapon. And I think uh, member states, those who are NATO uh, states, uh, certainly I understand they cannot, uh, why not, but uh, they don't want to participate in this conflict to save Ukraine, must take their, um, uh, their actions uh, as much as possible to support Ukraine militarily. Maybe not directly involved with the Russia uh, in, in the war, but we need to save Ukraine. If we don't save Ukraine, God forbid, everything will be born in Europe. And uh, don't, uh, uh, nobody should think that if Putin will win, uh, at the, he will he will stop there. Even then, uh, b before the war in Georgia, President Saakashvili was saying that if you don't give us now map, uh, Putin will attack. Uh, and this happened after uh, the Georgia. He said that next will be Crimea, and nobody was not nobody, but 
a uh, very small number of people were listening to him. And Crimea happened. Then Donbass happened. So now, at least now, we have to wake up and, and uh, uh, put this uh, gangster, and I think it's a very good term, uh, term a geopolitical terrorist, uh, hold accountable. Geopolitical terrorism must be defeated militarily because he's in Ukraine right now. He's bombing children. He's bombing Ukrainian uh, cities. Therefore, he must be defeated. That's why I personally also here do something to help Ukrainians fight this evil, fight this geopolitical terrorist. That's what we need to do now. Absolutely, these um, the sanctions are very good. Uh, and uh, uh, European perspective for Ukraine, I hope uh, Georgia and uh, uh, Moldova certainly will share this too, though we have now uh, in Georgia government, which is shamefully now trying to stay away from supporting Ukraine. And um, because of this, Ukraine withdrew its ambassador. And we have a government which holds President Saakashvili as a Putin's private uh, personal prisoner hostage in, uh, in the prison, this government. But this government, I hope, will be changed. And I hope Georgia and Moldova will join Ukraine. Um, but at this time, all of us Europeans must help Ukraine to survive physically. And we have to do everything to let Ukraine win this war, not less, not more. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Baramidze. We'll come back to you. Stay on the line, please, uh, if possible, uh, during your travel. Uh, but let's go now to uh, Ms. Votiga. Ms. Votiga, uh, what are your thoughts uh, listening to what uh, just uh, Mr. Baramidze said? Uh, and uh, uh, you professionally was, uh, have been ver uh, has been very involved with the Polish uh, process of uh, uh, EU accession. Uh, right, there is a big change uh, from uh, those times and nowadays, right? Uh, well, of course, there is big change, but let me first reflect on, on Ukraine and Georgia. And I am very happy to see a prominent uh, Georgian, former uh, Deputy Prime Minister Baramidze, so much involved in, in the Ukrainian issues uh, assisting uh, so effectively um, uh, Ukrainian people and, and speaking, uh, staying outspoken. I, I'm aware of, of uh, position, official position of the Georgian government, but I'm also very much aware about massive protests in uh, Tbilisi, uh, of the position of the third uh, president of Georgia, Mikhail Saakashvili, and many others. I think that future Georgia is yours, uh, and your future is uh, Western direction. Uh, so I'm uh, very much sure that uh, together with Ukraine, also Georgia and Moldova, to, to, to join Mr. Baramidze is uh, to be much closer to collective West by, by Western institutions. When we think about Europe of EU, if you wish, and understand that uh, Europe is a cradle of, collect of collective West, of Western civilization, Western culture. Therefore, what happens on our uh, Eastern borders is uh, extremely important for future of whole civilization. Actually, uh, I myself, uh, already during time of, of Smolensk, immediately after Smolensk catastrophe, pledged to myself that first and foremost, I'll do my best to, to cooperate with uh, all that, that wish to bring our Eastern neighbors closer to us. They are part of, of Western culture, Surely Georgia is, and Ukraine naturally as well. 
Yes, you are right, Prime Minister. Today, all of us, we are Ukrainians. And actually, in the first hours of, of this six days war, already six days, I was convinced about Ukraine winning, Ukrainians winning this war. They are invincible because people fighting for their freedom, for, for their uh, independence, for their uh, sovereign state are sim simply much more motivated than any rock state uh, army. And surely, according to our resolution that we negotiated uh, quite long, actually, it was a difficult process, yet the final outcome is very positive. Uh, we name Putin and Lukashenko war criminals and want to, to uh, ensure their, uh, them being brought to, to justice, to international uh, courts, tribunals, and, and surely we'll do this. We'll do this together with our Eastern partners. Mr. Potega, uh, just a quick question. Uh, Mr. Zelensky called for uh, an urgent procedure uh, for uh, Ukraine for its EU accession. Uh, well, is there uh, is there an option for such a such kind of urgent special procedure for Ukraine? Of course, there is an option. It's always political will, in particular in time of of challenge. Unfortunately, we have a grave challenge ahead of us, and in order to to stay secure and safe. We have to to make bold steps, and and uh, accession of of uh, Ukraine is a quite bold uh, step. Now Ukraine has uh, supporters all all over Europe, maybe not uh, among all decision makers, but surely my country is. Uh, real advocate of, of Ukraine and I'm absolutely sure that process open for Ukraine is to bring changes to, to Georgia. Moldova is uh, already on a much better path yet with uh, many obstacles uh, to remove. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Potiga. Uh, let's go back to Mr. Baramidze. Uh, where are you now, uh, Mr. Baramidze? And, uh, I just arrived to the train station of Lviv. What you do see? you see there? Are there queues of refu uh, refugees or? You see? No, I, I can. Uh, yeah. I could Thank you. Thank you for you. this picture. Yeah. So this is really tragic moment, yeah. and then I, I hope uh, uh, eventually historic uh, moment of the victory over the evil. Uh, uh, of Ukrainian people, and not only Ukrainian people. Uh, as I've said, uh, uh, Polish people are doing uh, great, and uh, all other nations uh, uh, of European Union, uh, United States, Canada, and other uh, representatives of the civilized uh, world. And um, I, I really hope that uh, these uh, days will be remembered as a tragic days, but... Uh, all these things uh, will be um, over with the defeat of the geopolitical uh, terrorist and geopolitical terrorism. Uh, one second, please. I, I'll, I'll remove my, my back uh, from the bus. Okay, thank uh, you very much, uh, Mr. Baramidze. Uh, Mr. Legutko, um, your uh, closing remark, because uh, we are under a time pressure. Uh, we have to close uh, well, I think, our I, I first think, panel. I think it's a, it's a very uh, exceptional moment nowadays. T tragic, but politically exceptional. So we have to make the best of it, uh, like uh, uh, pulling uh, Ukraine into the European Union and uh, uh, using the, the, uh, the pro-Ukrainian and anti 
put in atmosphere uh, that is still in many countries of Europe. Uh, uh, such special moments do not last long, so we have to make the best of it. Okay, thank you very, very much uh, uh, indeed. Uh, uh, we'll be uh, shortly again uh, with you. Uh, don't go away. Varmt välkomna till Stockholm och SCR-gruppens turné för framtidens Europa. We started this ECR vision of Europe's future already six months ago. And we did it with one intention. Make sure that every citizen of each member state knows that there is an alternative future for European Union. Ja, det är ju mycket som händer nu både i Sverige och i Europa och övriga omvärlden. Vi står inför stora utmaningar både vad gäller migration, organiserad brottslighet och ekonomin och den rådande pandemin. The fact is that we in the ECR group are the true supporters of Europe because Europe does not mean or at least should not mean a centralized bureaucratic set of institutions. Europe should describe the great variety of nations that make our continent such a vibrant and significant place. A future that doesn't create conflict between friends and allies and a future that protects tradition, values and national identities. In short, the noble idea of the founding fathers of uniting the nations of Europe in a community of cooperation had been forgotten and replaced with an attempt to build a centralized superstate. Vår vision för Europa den präglas av starka nationella demokratier med ett stort medborgarinflytande. Där varje nation ska avgöra sin egen framtid och även de minsta nationernas egenskaper och unika kulturer ska respekteras. Är det EU vi har idag verkligen så demokratiskt som man vill att det ska vara? The diversity of opinions for example is one of our continent's greatest strengths. But we see little spaces for free speech of different points of view in many of the big debates in Brussels. A Europe that is not listening to its citizens cannot be strong, not inside Europe itself and also not internationally. Verder is denk ik nodig dat we het takenpakket van de Europese Unie heel goed afbaken. De Europese Unie moet zich alleen bezighouden met grensoverschrijdende onderwerpen, bijvoorbeeld handel en migratie. Inom eh, invandringsområdet där vi definitivt ska bestämma det eh, själva hemma i vårt land, vad vi klarar av och vad vi inte klarar av. Så att, nej, jag, jag ser eh, alltså det, det går på fel håll. Man har stora ambitioner och den konservativa rösten den behövs mer än någonsin. Och... So in this would be the first one I would say the EU needs to come with a plan to stop not only on documents but in reality actions to stop the human smugglers to have negotiated return policy to third countries to stop the boats from departing. Och där även de här mer vänsterliberala partierna ändå fick upp ögonen för att det finns en gräns för vad vi klarar. Vi har ju sagt det länge. Så förstår jag att vi behöver ha samarbeten eftersom vi ändå har en yttre gräns och så. Så tycker jag det är viktigt att vi gör gemensam sak för att, att hålla den gränsen. Vi ser ju samarbetet i Europa som självklart. Samarbete kring handel, samarbete kring eh, miljöproblem som ju inte känner några gränser. Det är svårt att bekämpa miljöproblem bara i ett enskilt mm. land. Eh, internationellt organiserad brottslighet är också en sån sak där vi måste samarbeta och där EU fyller en funktion. Kriminaliteten som tyvärr ökar för oss nu mycket tack vare, eller tack vare på grund av att vi har den fria rörligheten inom EU och bristande gränskontroller. Och det här har gjort att vi ser en ökad gränsöverskridande kriminalitet i Sverige, vapensmuggling och så vidare. Och även tullen har ju en väldigt viktig roll som skulle kunna göra mycket mer än vad de kan göra idag. Man låser sitt hem om natten därför att man hatar alla människor som finns utanför en hem. Man låser sitt hem om natten därför att man älskar sitt hem, framförallt därför att man älskar de människor som finns inuti det här hemmet.
Och lösningen är det att vi alla tar ansvar som nationer genom att stärka våra respektive länders rättsväsenden och använda det som en utgångspunkt för samarbete. Vi behöver ju brida hela EU-projektet tillbaka till grunderna och grunderna är ju egentligen den inre marknaden, frihandel, fri rörlighet av, av varor och tjänster och kapital och så vidare. Det, det är liksom grunden. Europas länder har hittills haft ett bra samarbete sinsemellan utan överstatlighet och utan att Bryssel har lagt sig. Varför ska vi gå ifrån ett fungerande koncept genom att ge mer makt och centralisering till EU? Our idea is to stimulate a new debate, to offer a new hope for Europe, to discuss ways we can put our national democracies back at the heart of the European idea. Europa jest dobrem wspólnym. Różnimy się, ale powinno nas łączyć wspólne dziedzictwo. Powróćmy do Unii Europejskiej, która z tego dziedzictwa wyrasta i która szanuje narodowe tożsamości. Only the European Union without arrogance, based on solidarity and mutual respect for its member states, can regain the support of the European nations. We can do it together. Welcome to our next uh, panel discussion. What can the European Union offer to the Eastern neighborhood countries? On uh, our remote connection, we have uh, now uh, Mr. Krasnodiebski, a uh, member of the European Parliament. And uh, also uh, we have uh, our VIP guest, Mr. Ostap Semerak, former Minister of Ecology of Ukraine between 2016 and 2019. Uh, actually, uh, Mr. Semerak uh, uh, was uh, meant uh, initially to talk about the energy policy, but sin since uh, um, under the circumstances, uh, under the events uh, that happened in uh, Ukraine after the Russian invasion, uh, let, us, let me first ask you, uh, Mr. Semerak, how do you feel about all these events happening now in Ukraine? Uh, thank you, first of all, for the opportunity to talk and to be with you. Uh, honestly saying, we agreed with uh, Professor Krasnodevsky to talk uh, before uh, uh, about Green Deal and uh, climate changes and fights uh, against climate changes. But uh, unfortunately, the situation in, in Ukraine forced us to, to talk a little bit, uh, not, not a little bit, but seriously, quite different situation. Actually, what is going now in Ukraine that is real genocide against Ukrainian nation. Because during last days, uh, Russian army and uh, some, some, some information we have that uh, Belarusia joined today, they are attacking not only Ukrainian troops, but they are attacking uh, civil people and they are bombing um, the, the, the blocks where uh, people live uh, in a, in a big cities in the small cities of, of Ukraine actually that is not uh, um, that is not uh, war between uh, or battle between middle military troops that is a battle of Putin and his army and uh, his alliance uh, Lukashenko against the whole uh, European na nation and our people and our country and unfortunately, I cannot say that uh, the, uh, his his aim is uh, is only Ukraine. Unfortunately, he is uh, against all democracy. And he is against 
all European uh, values and he is against uh, countries like like Ukraine, like Georgia and uh, Mr. Baramidze was, I heard him a little bit uh, during his his uh, participation in your, uh, in your program just now. So uh, we have to resist and uh, today's um, decision uh, of European Parliament give us uh, big political support. I I have to say thank you for, for that decision. I have to say thank you to all our friends and all European nations for great support, for sanctions, for severe sanctions, for weapons. And I, I have to say that that is not enough. Unfortunately, we need more support. Unfortunately, we need more, um, uh, more arms, more um, uh, strict um, uh, sanctions against against Putin. We have to stop him and his army because he is destroying Ukraine. He is destroying uh, our cities, our villages, and he is coming to Europe. Mr. Krasnodersky, uh, what are your comments on that? What, what, what is your comment on uh, what uh, just uh, Mr. Semerak said? Yes, yes, I ho hope you hear me, yeah? Yes. Yes, I, I just wanted, as a first of all, about uh, some, uh, a word about energy. Because uh, I, I think it is uh, Mr. Baramidze said something about mistakes. Mistakes of the West, of the Europe, and these mistakes uh, uh, influence uh, this, uh, also this war of contributed to the possibility of this war against Ukraine. And one of this is an energy dependency on the EU, on, on Russian supply. We all know how hesitant was Germany to support, uh, support Ukraine. Uh, and I think th there's also one other aspect we should mention, that uh, if we are talking about uh, choice of the Europe as a civilization. We all are Europeans, Georgian, uh, Ukrainian, Poles, uh, uh, French, uh, Germans, and, and so on. And we, uh, we know what is a different civilization in which there is no respect for fundamental human rights and for human dignity and, and so on. And I think Ukrainian people, Polish people, and the other who had a, who had a possibility to uh, to uh, to have a contact with uh, with Russians, uh, with different forms of Russian despots, with communism, but also with the Tsarist Ra Russia. We know that it is a different kind of civilization. We hope, of course, that uh, Russia can 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 change. Yeah, but it didn't change. But on the other hand, we had all, all we had always, and this was our also our discussion in ECR group during this. Uh, many conferences we organize, we have a crisis in Europe. Also a crisis concerning uh, our values and our civilization. And uh, I hope also, because I totally agree with my Ukraine colleague that, uh, that it is not, this is not only war between Ukraine and Russia, this is not only aggression Russia against Ukraine. As actually Ukrainians fight now for all of us, yeah? Uh, we know that uh, probably we could be the next. Uh, 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 Kiev uh, is uh, now uh, attacked, maybe if uh, with, is uh, defended with bravery. And uh, and I think what our Ukrainians now doing is actually can help Europe to overcome this uh, spiritual or cultural crisis and to. Uh, to remind or to remember what are the basic values of European civilization that we, in the face of the of such a danger, we have to 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 fight. We have to be courageous, and we have to forego uh, some some problems which uh, sometimes or some uh, seems to be um, um, to have a priority, but they, they are. They are actually sec secondary. So I think the, this is an occasion for political change also in, in Europe. And uh, I can promise also that we will support our Ukrainian friends. 
Mr. Krasnodiepski, uh, do you have a question to uh, Mr. Semerak? Is there anything specific you, you want to ask him? Yes, yes. I just wanted to say, if you, if you, you say that in which way can we, can we help you now, now in the, and also in long term, in, in order to, uh, to fight against this uh, the aggression and then in, in the future to develop your country? Thank you for that question. Um, actually, we need to resist. And the question of our resistance, that is the question of uh, supply of our society and our army. And um, uh, countries of European Union already decided to send um, arms to, to Ukraine. And uh, that is a that is good decision, but we need uh, more. And um, unfortunately, we have um, we have very strong uh, press and uh, unfortunately we, we do not have um, clean or protected air because um, uh, when we are talking about arms we have to talk about uh, uh, closing of uh, of the air and um, in in ukraine and um, we are talking our our leadership is talking with uh, with nato countries with uh, nato leaders about this support because you know they are using rockets, they are using uh, ballistic rockets, uh, they are using aircrafts to attack uh, our cities from uh, Belarusian territory, territory, from Russian territory. And uh, you know, half an hour ago uh, in Kyiv, our TV center was attacked by uh, rockets uh, from, uh, from Russian um, aircrafts. And uh, they, they feel that they cannot um, uh, they cannot beat us on a land, so they are using air, and we have to to to, to get that that support of uh, closing Ukrainian air. Uh, when we are talking about uh, society and humanitarian uh, support, uh, actually in those cities that are uh, on the east, um, there is very limited. Um, um, sources of uh, supply of food supply of uh, medical supply supply and uh, the, the same the same crisis is coming to the central uh, ukraine now we have uh, great support but i guess we have to think about enlarging of it uh, thank that, you that very much the, that is that is for the short period but uh, for the long period, that is as well good good part of the uh, of the question, and we think not only how to resist, but the question will be how to rebuild, and uh, actually that that will be a great discussion and great uh, talk, I guess after after the stop of this war after our win, and uh, I think that uh, that is absolutely understandable that Ukraine should be supported by. Uh, this big reconstruction and rebuilding, but let's firstly win this that war against uh, against Putin and against his uh, terrorists because what they are doing that is a terror against the civilian uh, people. Where are you now, Mr. Semerak? Uh, I'm not in Kiev. You? I'm not in Kiev. I'm on the, on the western part, and uh, you know I'm traveling a little bit because of the, some some reasons. How, how safe is it uh, now in, in the place uh, you are situated now? Is it safe enough? I, yeah, I, I hope yes. Thank you. Uh, what, Thank about, you. Uh, what about the big cities, Kiev, uh, Kharkov uh, and the other big cities? I'm on a, I'm on a phone contact with my friends uh, in, a, in a Kiev, uh, just talk uh, one hour before our conversation. And uh, they, they told me that it was absolutely in that moment of the time, uh, quite air. But uh, as I said to you, uh, half uh, an hour after that, uh, the center of Kyiv was attacked by aircrafts. You saw this uh, dramatic uh, picture of Kharkiv today morning when the same, the same situation was, they attacked from the air of the center of, of city. So they destroyed the building of uh, uh, state, uh, state administration. Uh, they bombed uh, yesterday and today uh, other blocks of, of the city where civilians uh, are and that is something terrible. Uh, 
Mr. Krasnodiebsky, am I ask you uh, uh, about the, uh, the Mr. Zelensky's uh, uh, call? Uh, he, he wants uh, the European Union to open an urgent procedure for EU accession for Ukraine. What's your comment on, on that? Yes, uh, we, of course, you know, in Poland, we support this uh, in years. And uh, this is the question. Um, I, I think that we in the EU should ask ourselves. You, you see, I had this discussion in the European Parliament, and I'm a little disappointed, I must say. In one respect, not in in now in this, you know, general support, and this is uh, for Ukraine and uh, with um, uh, emotion and, and so, and also signs of solidarity. But there is no uh, word self-criticism. Yeah, because I remember 2014, we also react emotionally. But this is the question, did we, did we enough uh, to, uh, to avoid this? Uh, did we unite to stop the influence of Putin in, uh, in Europe? Uh, did we uh, enough to, to be effective? Uh, was it really right to say by President Biden so many times that uh, there would be not uh, military support for, uh, direct military support for Ukraine? Uh, I, I think there is uh, also a need for self-criticism in Europe now. And, uh, and if we will be self-critical, then maybe this possibility to open up now the possibility to, that Ukraine will join the EU will be re realistic. Because uh, you, you see this uh, self-satisfaction, which, uh, which is, if I hear our uh, president of the European Commission, and I know how it's now the frustration in German, for instance, that the German army is so weak. I ask myself, who was me, Madame uh, uh, Ursula von der Leyen several years ago? She was a minister of the defense. Uh, I know that uh, this is not the moment for our Ukrainian friends to, to talk um, critically about, about so-called Western po po politics, but uh, I think I, I can do this, and I think I can demand also from 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 the politician, from President of France, from, from Chancellor of Germany, and so on, and from President of United States, and also of my colleagues from the European Parliament. Do not be so <clears throat> so self-satisfactory. Ask yourself: Did you? Did you? Uh, have you done everything to help Ukraine, to help Georgia, uh, also the other uh, countries of Eastern Partnership, to be closer to Union, to rebuild their, their, their countries, and so on? My answer it would be would be quite skeptical about this. And now there's a, probably now there's a moment to re really to, to to change, to rethink what uh, Europe is how the, is realistic the, the, the policy, what is our geopolitical situation. I, I just, uh, to mention one only aspect, which is very symbolic, this Nord Stream 2. ECR group proposed a year ago, many times, to have a discussion about uh, Nord Stream, dedicated discussion about this topic, not about gas and gas supply in general. And well, it was always rejected by main political groups, by European People's Party and, 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 and so on. And uh, so this is today my questions and the colleagues. Was it right? Was it right that we never, we are talking about rule of law, but we never talked in European Parliament about the influence of, of the Putin uh, in, in, in Europe, about many former European politicians who are working for, for Russian companies and, and so on. Now it is time to self-criticism and not uh, for self-satisfaction. And finally, in this regard, Mr. Krasnodiebsky, uh, wh what can the European Union uh, do from now on uh, uh, for, uh, in the field of uh, uh, the energy sources diversity? It should be totally reoriented their policy, and it has already started, you, you, you know, uh, in the countries which were so dependent. 
dependent on, on, on Russia's supply. But uh, there's the questions not only not to, 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 to stop the Nord Stream uh, uh, two, but also to resign of Nord Stream, Nord Stream one. We have to rethink our policy. We have to strengthen our military, and we have to help with equipment our uh, our uh, um, friends in, in in Ukraine, Ukraine army, support them, because as I said, they fight for us, and. Uh, so uh, and it should be uh, the swift uh, this uh, swift system uh, the, this um, uh, exclusion of Russian should be not only limited to 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 to, to some banks but it should be it should be general. Now the Russia should be paria of the of the of the uh, uh, Western world. We shouldn't. Uh, uh, trade with them, and we should uh, should not uh, should treat them the, properly. Because uh, as uh, as we had, this is a ge genocide. It is aggression. This aggression without any um, any uh, justification. Man, um, even more, it was. Uh, uh, if you if we refer to the speech by Mr. Putin, who, who actually uh, said that Ukraine has uh, have, have no right to. to to, to be a nation and the, and, and, and the state. Yeah. Thank you very much. And this Thank is international law. Thank you very, very much, uh, Mr. Krasnodiebski. Mr. Semerak, if you um, want to say some final words, uh, because we are closing this panel, please go ahead. Yeah, I would, li yeah, yeah. I would like uh, shortly say that uh, minute, um, fo fo follow following uh, the last uh, thoughts of uh, Mr. Krasnodemsky, I fully support. But uh, from my side, I would I would not like to criticize our our mistakes and mistakes of European Union. Uh, we we have to do this after after our win, and now we have to be much as much as it is possible solidarity uh, united, and only this uh, unification and united uh, answer from European uh, and Ukrainian side. Uh, that is the only key how to to win this uh, battle against Putin and against his uh, fascism. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Semerak. Uh, thank you for being our guest. Uh, we are going to now our next panel. Welcome to our next panel. Uh, our guest in, in the studio is uh, Mr. Uh, Vitol Yashnovzhevsky, Chair of the European Parliament Delegation to the EU-Ukraine Parliamentary Association Committee and first Vice Chair of the European Parliament Committee on Foreign Affairs and former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Poland between 2015 and 2018. Welcome Thank to you. our good studio. Thank to be here. Let me correct my name. My name is Witold Waszczykowski. Waszczykowski. Uh, I apologize. I'm coming from... I know, it's very from, difficult. ...from another Even country. In and Poland. The pronunciation, pronunciation okay. uh, uh, of some of uh, Polish names are difficult uh, to us. Uh, I apologize uh, once again. Uh, Mr. Uh, Waszczykowski, uh, was it the right... Uh, pronunciation. W would you would you like to to make some remarks on uh, uh, on uh, the the discussion uh, we just ended? Yes, for years we were discussing how to make Europe uh, united, free, democratic, uh, working together. 
And uh, when uh, at the end of 1990s, uh, beginning of uh, 2000s, uh, some countries of Central Europe joined NATO, the European Union, uh, we realized, however, that many countries located uh, east of the Polish border were outside of this framework. That means that we found Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, Belarus, and um, Caucasian republics, the whole uh, concept of Europe uh, united, free, and democratic was not over. Uh, so we decided, this, this started uh, some years ago to think how we can bring this country to the European Union process of integration. Unfortunately, the, uh, the first idea was not very promising because the idea of uh, neighborhood plus policy, which turned next to be called as the uh, Eastern Partnership, was the idea to keep them away from Russia, but not to bring them uh, to European Union. Actually, it was endless uh, mm -hmm. waiting room for this, for this country. Uh, let me also remind you that uh, 2008, when we were hoping to grant the, some of these countries like Georgia and Ukraine, membership action plan mm -hmm. to NATO was uh, cancelled actually by our Western friends. That was the signal for Russia to attack uh, Georgia and, uh, and give them and teach the lesson Georgia not to think even about further unification with the with the West. So now we we have to think under the pressure of the war how to unite uh, at least Ukraine, the biggest partner of the Partnership for Peace, uh, partnership, Eastern Partnership uh, Programme. And my idea is that, which I advocate for the last two years, that uh, there are some stages that we can bring uh, Ukraine closer and closer. First of all, we can open European Union initiative, which is called uh, Three Seas Initiatives. This initiative relates to the security, uh, energy security area and uh, will bring Ukraine to the network of uh, transportation in, in our part of, of Europe. Then we can open uh, sectoral policy of the European Union for, for Ukraine, but I think also that for other countries which are ready to join the European Union, which is Georgia and Moldova, why not? Then the next step, we can open the agencies, European Union agencies for, for the Ukraine. The next step could be to, to grant them access to the single market. We have two countries in Europe which do not belong to the European Union, which is Sweden and Norway, but they can uh, freely exist on the single market of the European Union. Of course, they have to pay the fee. Um, and finally, of course, after the uh, implementation of these steps, we can think about the membership. Right now, with the situation which is on the front and, uh, and the position of many European countries, we can live it uh, faster, we can speed up the process and first we can take some political decisions and bring this country, I mean Ukraine, as close as possible to European Union, first to grant them candidacy uh, status. The problem will be the next step, how European Union Commission will react to the huge uh, acquis communautaire. These are the thousand uh, pages of legislation which is supposed to it? implement it. Well, if we stick to the Copenhagen criteria and acquis communautaire, it will take years of course, to uh, implement and adopt this legislation. So we have to follow the political path. Uh, we used to do this in the, in the past, for instance, for Greece, for Portugal, for, uh, for Spain. Uh, the path for the membership was much, much faster and uh, we, can, we can follow, we can repeat actually this, this kind of, the same kind of a pattern also for Ukraine. 
Okay, let me now introduce our remote speakers, uh, Mr. Franak Viachorka, senior advisor to Svetlana Tikhanovska, uh, leader of the Belarusian opposition, and uh, uh, Ms. Tinian, Tinatin, I'm sorry, Tinatin Akhvlediani, Georgian Research Fellow uh, at the uh, Brussels-based uh, Center for European Policy Studies. Welcome, welcome to our program. Uh, Mr. Viachorka, um, there is no doubt uh, that uh, Alexander Lukashenko's uh, regime uh, is supporting the Russian invasion in uh, Ukraine. What is, what is the Belarusian opposition's reaction on, on this situation? There is no sound. Uh, can you? Please. Uh, we will try one to, to, three, to, one to, three. To, to make the connection better. Yes, now, now we hear you. Uh, did you hear my okay, question good. or uh, I'm supposed to repeat it? So I hope you hear me now, right? Yes, we are hearing yeah. you. Uh, please uh, no, tell us, uh, uh, it's obvious that uh, there is uh, Lukashenko's uh, regime is supporting uh, the Russian invasion in uh, Ukraine. And what is uh, the Belarusian opposition's uh, opinion on reaction on, on that? Yeah, first of all, thank you for having me and uh, let me greet you on behalf of Svetlana Tsikhanovska and Belarusian people. It's evident that um, uh, Lukashenko's forces are joining Putin's forces in aggression against Ukraine. The uh, Russian um, uh, army is being served and aided by Lukashenko's um, uh, services. For example, air defense systems are helping um, missiles launches. We know that Belarusian um, airfields are used by Russian helicopters and warplanes. Um, also, Belarus hospitals are serving wounded Russian uh, soldiers. Also, we hear that uh, every hour the attack by Russian tanks can begin against Ukraine, and it will change many things. It will mean the direct attack of Belarus on, on Ukraine. And, and we as Belarus society, we are uh, fully um, uh, um, against it. Uh, we are trying to stop it. And we are trying to raise people uh, for protest. Uh, going now to Tina uh, Tina uh, Hvlediani. Welcome to our program, Ms. Hvlediani. Um, if we try to forget uh, for uh, for a minute uh, the situation uh, in Ukraine, uh, could you tell us uh, some more about uh, uh, the the ties between Georgia and the European Union, uh, how they uh, evolve o over time? Uh, knowing uh, that in your work you mainly focus on um, economic dimension of the Eastern Partnership. Sure. Can I go ahead? Yeah, please go ahead. No, thanks. Thanks for having me. And let me also like start noticing that seeing Veronica on the screen just makes me very happy seeing her safe. Let me also use this opportunity to send my warmest greetings to my friends and colleagues in Kiev and all over the Ukraine. Um, now, indeed, I am here speaking as a trade economist by training, but these region because it's very turbulent, um, you know, makes uh, other things uh, more pressing to discuss today. And uh, let me start, you know, by noticing that indeed we don't need to forget about Ukraine while we are speaking about Georgia. Instead, we have to acknowledge, as just uh, made here comments by you, that um, Eastern Partnership starts with the price that Georgia has paid back in 2008 by going in the war with Russia, just for the same reason as Ukraine is doing now, for choosing its future. This was the price paid by, by, back then by Georgia, and this was then followed by launching the Eastern Partnership policy by the European Union, right? And as, I mean, uh, a decade after, Georgia and Ukraine are still together in this destiny, sharing this very violent and mad neighbor, but also having very similar aspirations uh, for the European integration, together with Moldova. And these three countries uh, form the uh, basically associated trio, which at the end of the day, find themselves at a different um, page from the other three Eastern 
Eastern Partnership countries, which are uh, Eastern Partnership countries, which are Belarus, Azerbaijan, and uh, Armenia. So what we have today, I think it's very important to mention that Eastern Partnership, as it is today in its format, as already discussed uh, by you earlier does not necessarily uh, serve the purpose to shape the future of EU's eastern neighbours. Uh, we at SEPS, uh, well, in, in research, we, the, the representatives of civil society, have been mentioning quite, quite many times that this partnership, this policy, has lacked security uh, dimensions, and this partnership was not putting forward the membership perspectives for the, for the, members, for, for the countries that actually showed their adherence, that actually paid the price, like Georgia, like Ukraine, and like Moldova. So that's what we're facing right now today with, uh, with Putin's Med, uh, med invasion. And to bring into discussion the trade dimension, because it's, it's uh, also very important for, for these countries to come closer to the European single market, um, and also already mentioned by you, the Aki Communautaire, let me mention here that in in fact, as we stand today, Georgia, Ukraine, Moldova are not that far from um, having Iwaki in um, a basically already approximated. Uh, Georgia has made a um, immense progress on that, so was done by Ukraine and Moldova. There are some delays, but most of the EU legislation is there. It's, uh, it's the work in progress. It's, in the, it's coming in the pipeline. Obviously, uh, let me also mention that the challenge is here, the implementation and proper implementation of the EU legislation in practice, but the progress is something that has to be acknowledged, and progress was there impressive. Therefore, this gives us more uh, background for push further the membership perspectives of Georgia and Moldova along with Ukraine. And it's also time that the EU reconsiders its Eastern Partnership policy and um, goes maybe with a different pa path with the other countries that apparently made different choices. Uh, now, if we still have time, let me comment with the trade. Uh, well, trade is very particular because trade comes and builds on the uh, individual characteristics of these economies we're speaking about. Now, here, Ukraine represents a very large market and we can't compare uh, it with, the, with Georgia's small market or Moldova's relatively small market small market either. But this CFTA here put uh, very tangible possibilities which have to be further exploited. And if we look at the agreements, there are a number of reservations that the EU has been keeping, for instance, in services sectors, in a number of areas, the DCFTAs are also outdated because they fall behind these EU policies on the green and digital transformation. So there is a lot to basically reconsider for the European Union and for its associated trio to put the agreements and to put this policy into at a different level. Thank you. Uh, let me introduce you to uh, our next uh, keynote speaker, uh, Ms. Veronika Movchan, uh, uh, Academic Director, Head of the Center of Economic Studies, uh, Institute for Economic Research and uh, Policy uh, Consulting. Uh, uh, Ms. Movchan, uh, to you, what can you add to, to all these uh, remarks you, you have heard. Okay, thank you very much. It's my great pleasure to be here today. And thank you, Tina, for, for, for your kind words. I'm also happy to see you and all the colleagues. Uh, the situation in Ukraine where I am now is very difficult, as you all know, but uh, the country is fighting and I am very grateful for all the colleagues who already said that we have no choice rather than to win because if we will be defeated, if we lose, uh, there's only not only the Ukraine as a nation will lose its uh, future, but I, I sincerely believe that the threat will be for, uh, if not whole continent, but half of the continent uh, to lose their future because Ukraine was attacked basically for the only reason that we exist as Ukraine. And we want to be a part of the European Union. We want to be democratic. We want uh, to be free and choose our future by ourselves. And that's, that's, that, this is unacceptable for, for European civilization in in this 21st century. So I'm very grateful for all our partners for what they are doing and trying to answer the question, what is next and whether Ukraine can and uh, 
actually three also Georgia and Moldova can join the EU. Yes, the aspirations there and Ukraine with and Ukraine and Georgia and Moldova with the association agreement, we prepared to this membership uh, quite substantially because the most of European is already in the association agreement. And uh, after actually eight years of implementation, the countries achieved the major progress. And one of the interesting facts, for example, just a couple hours before Russian attack, Ukraine just entered, Ukraine with Moldova entered into autonomous mode in their electricity system as the test for preparation for uh, joining NTSOE in 2023. I know that you is now considering uh, joining, bringing Ukraine to the European electricity system, electricity grid faster because Ukraine is definitely not going to rejoin the former, the Soviet Union, Russian, Belarusian grids anymore. It's, it's just, it became completely impossible after the war started. But Basically, this preparation is technical preparation, but it preceded with huge legal work. And it's in many other areas The Ukraine and two other three countries did a lot. What can EU do more? First time, once again, thank you for what you already did. The uh, opportunity for Ukraine to become a candidate country is a real, like... Uh, huge moral, not only moral support for the whole country who is fighting now in a very hard fight with uh, Russia. Uh, we definitely, as a basic need now, Ukraine needs weapons. It needs uh, uh, any any military help is possible. And also, if it's possible to somehow shield the sky, it would be great because the uh, bombing is ongoing. And regretfully, if first days, it was indeed bombing of the infrastructure, military infrastructure, like airports, like military bases. Now it's a bombing of... Uh, civilians. We already have a uh, situation that the maternity hospital was built uh, in Kiev was bombed and children and mothers were, built, uh, were killed. We have, uh, we have bombings of just, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's called genocide. I don't know how to, to call it properly, but it's just killing people who are not fighters who are who never thought that uh, the country, neighboring country, could could potentially attack them. So we need military support. We regretfully need humanitarian support and uh, can be food pharmaceuticals, uh, because despite Ukraine has been feeding so many millions of people now with disrupted supplies, with factories starting to follow the military needs. We, we need the uh, urgent supplies because everything is just disrupted. Okay. And we definitely just, need yes. to think about Please sanctions. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I just, sanctions I just, again and then your support. Okay, I just want, wanted to, to ask you, you uh, uh, just in short, if you can uh, make uh, uh, a pro prognosis, what will be the outcome of uh, all this? and. Uh, what about the people who are now in in uh, uh, Ukrainian capital in Kiev? Uh, uh, are they uh, uh, intending to to go out uh, to 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 try to to find a, a safe shelter? There are two types of people. One are in the shelters or at homes and hoping that nothing will. Like it will not be had, but it's many, many people, and not only Kiev, who are preparing to fight and fight fiercely. Preparing these Molotov cocktails, uh, building blocks on the roads, doing everything to stop Ukraine. The issue that is not uh, the military men, army, Ukrainian army is fighting. The whole Ukraine is fighting. So many people, uh, including like uh, we have children. Uh, uh, school boys who, who are in uh, in cyber doing cyber attacks or preparing these cocktails. We have uh, women who are once again like in Maidan 
they are preparing food and helping. The whole Ukraine is now trying to ensure supplies and support uh, each other. There is a nation fighting against the aggressor. And I'm sure we have no choice other than to win, because otherwise we will be killed one by one. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ms. Mofchan. Uh, stay on the line, please. Uh, we have uh, uh, two more keynote speakers. Uh, uh, Ms., uh, Mr. Devan Pohusyan uh, from Armenia and uh, uh, Mr. Alexander Vondra, former Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Minister of Defence and Deputy Prime Minister for European Affairs of the Czech Republic. Uh, Mr. Vondra, first uh, uh, to you. Uh, using uh, uh, and knowing your uh, high-level expertise uh, in the field of uh, uh, foreign affairs policies and security policies. Uh, what is the perspective uh, for all these countries uh, within the Eastern uh, uh, Partnership uh, for EU accession? Look, uh, I don't know. Uh, hello, good mo good good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I don't know whether my uh, all life expertise uh, would uh, be here very helpful, because my ex expertise is connected with the development in Europe and in the world uh, right after uh, the Cold War, and that was an era of two, maybe three decades when most of the players were respecting certain rules, uh, certain principles, certain values, and were acting accordingly. I, I am afraid that with this brutal, unprovoked attack and military aggression by Putin in Ukraine, what we see just now, that is going to change the world substantially. And we will have to learn our expertise, that our expertise uh, from the past uh, maybe are not as much helpful. I was one of those who were at the beginning of the Eastern Partnership concept. It uh, was launched uh, in the spring 2009 during the Czech EU presidency. And in fact, uh, it was a materialization of an idea developed by the Polish, Czech and Swedish diplomat since the summer 2008 as a direct response to two things. One was, as Vitol has rightly mentioned, a inability of the NATO allies to agree on positively responding the request by Georgia and Ukraine for membership action plan. Simply, there was enough, not enough support, uh, mostly among uh, the Western European countries. So it was pretty clear that the hard security guarantees would not be available for the countries, uh, for those two countries. And at the same time, uh, in 2008, uh, EU has developed under the French presidency and French leadership, the so-called Union for Mediterranean, to ship the money and resources into the South, you know, just logically, you know, to contain the emerging chaos there. And we in Central and Eastern Europe were afraid that uh, we would be lacking the resources at least to provide a soft power support for the countries in between uh, the EU and NATO on one hand and Russia on the other hand. So, these two uh, things has led us to fight for the Eastern Partnership concept. We have won that, but, uh, you know, the subsequent development has showed that for Putin, even this concept of the soft, uh, soft security uh, help is something what is highly unlikely and undesirable, as the uh, provocation and the war against Georgia showed us immediately, and then the development in Ukraine with their association treaty and uh, pressing Yanukovych to, to decline that uh, from Kremlin. So, show that uh, Putin is not ready to 
uh, tolerate forever a peace or belt of the countries in between that would have the relationship with the West. Now there is a war and Ukraine is fighting for survival. I'm convinced that we have to help them by all available means, including the arms sale, uh, deliveries of arms, including allowing the people to fight there. Um, there is just one problem that the United States are not willing to engage militarily directly with Russia because it's a nuclear superpower. And Europeans, you know, are not enough, uh, strong enough to do this on their own because we do not have uh, a proper deterrent capabilities. But we are now heading, and that's my deep conviction, in a very different world, which will be driven more by, despite all those sympathies which we see now, uh, we are heading toward the world which would be more about the real politic, about the power. Kremlin, if the regime is not going to collapse, it may be, it may collapse due to the, uh, if the sanctions would be strong and long implemented, maybe, maybe it can collapse. But if it's not going to collapse, it will simply be fighting, you know, to be one of the pole of the future multipolar world, the China too, India too. So the West will have to operate in a, uh, in a very different environment. And this is the landscape when I am afraid would not be any, you know, kind of a neutral country in between. Look, Belarus is simply part of, uh, of the Russia imperial orbit now, is actively engaging in a war against Ukraine. On the other hand, Finland is already by one leg in, 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 in NATO, being one of the most active in delivering the support uh, to, to the Ukraine, much more than Spain or some other major Western European countries. Yeah. So, this is now, you know, Ukraine is fighting for everything and we have to help it by all available means. And how this fight will result, it will shape uh, uh, a lot in, in, in this part of uh, Europe for a pretty long time. Thank you for now, Mr. Vondra. Uh, now to you, Mr. Wojciechowski. What do you think about, uh, about the sanctions? Uh, will Russia collapse? under the sanctions? Uh, probably not tomorrow or day after tomorrow, because according to the different types of studies, when we look at the sanctions against South Africa, against Venezuela, Iran, uh, North Korea, it takes about one or two years uh, to wait for the result of this kind of sanction. But, <clears throat> uh, of course, it uh, could be a panic in, in Russia, and there is uh, some kind of a panic. People are uh, trying to get as much cash as possible. Putin is prepared for this situation. Let me remind you that Russia is huge. It, it's a, a huge table of Mendeleev tables, so they have everything. So they can stand a year or two with support of Kazakhstan or China. So the only option is first to deprive Russia of any income. So we have to exclude them from almost everything, including large part of the Russian society. Large part of Russian society lives and benefit uh, from this imperialistic policy. Not only oligarchs, but also celebrities, culture people and sports people. I cannot imagine to watch Bolshoi theater in, in Paris right now when they, the colleagues of them are shooting and bombing. Uh, but some uh, of the performances uh, yeah. was, uh, have been cancelled yeah, already. I, I cannot watch the Spartak Moscow football uh, players when the other guys are bombing Kiev. So they have to be totally excluded. The next step is to reinforce the eastern flank to deter Russia from any kind of thinking about the going further. And the most important is to make the Ukraine resilience. 
economically and military, they have to win this war. They have to defend themselves from the Russian uh, aggression. So as fast as possible, we have to deliver them the weapon to defend themselves and to survive this cruel act of aggression. Now going to Armenia, to Mr. Devan Pogusyan. Uh, welcome, Mr. Pogusyan. Uh, Mr. Pogusyan uh, is uh, leading the International Center for Human Development in Armenia. Uh, Mr. Pogusyan, uh, Armenia is uh, probably the on only the only uh, Eastern Partnership uh, country that doesn't perceive Russia as a threat uh, to its sovereignty. Uh, just the opposite. Uh, it perceives uh, Russia the guarantor of uh, its security against uh, two neighbors, Azerbaijan and Turkey. Uh, did anything uh, uh, with the situation in Ukraine now, with the war uh, that Russia started uh, in Ukraine, uh, change uh, something in this regard? Do you, uh, hi, everyone. First of all, thank you for the invitation. Do you mean change in perception of Armenia's nation? Uh, yes, definitely, it's changed, but it's changed a bit uh, earlier. Starting from 2013, when Armenia under the pressure, there wasn't been a final support from EU to join association agreement. And then uh, starting from September 27, 2020, when, as you mentioned, just so nicely neighbors, I would say that enemies, Turkey, which is your NATO member, and Azerbaijan, which is another member of the Eastern Partnership, open up in the open war, jointly attack Armenians and Armenia, have using the old type of militaries, which is used now, occupied Armenia and Artsakh Republic, killed more than 5,000 uh, people, beheaded a lot of stuff and used the phosphorus bombs, which has been sold uh, to Azerbaijan from another Eastern Partnership countries. And uh, we ne never heard any point of this. That's why if you meaning what is change, it's change in Armenia to understand that guys talking about values, talking about very a lot of promises is coming to the price of your country. Unfortunately, we small country. We don't have oil. We don't have gas. And doesn't matter how much we're trying to do our best in a democracy. If uh, it's attacked by countries who are bigger, like Turkey or country with gas, Azerbaijan, uh, no one would be caring, organizing a lot of discussions or at least opening up the sanctions. Now, there are so many uh, requests and calls from Armenia about uh, using your all possibilities, also to all EU countries, to push Azerbaijan to free all prisoners of war. Nothing is taking place. All Armenian uh, historical heritage, Armenian churches are now destroyed. Nothing is there going on. No one is visiting the, the red part of region. If you meaning if something changed in Armenia, definitely change. Uh, that's why on that regard, I think the question should be in this regard, how EU or Eastern Partnership Program could help raise Armenian issues in an equal way when the similar case is happening? On that regard, we would truly appreciate if, for example, the same kind of a discussion would be opened up on the destiny of prisoners of war, on the destiny of rights of uh, our people of the Artsakh Republic, and as well as also on the preservation of Armenian historical cultural uh, monuments and heritage, uh, and s after so many calls for the uh, UNESCO and all other re European countries to come and support on that regard. Definitely, there are a lot of things to be uh, helped. Uh, and why not if you, uh, EU is ready to provide military equipment also uh, to Armenia for being able to defend itself and also to help to liberate occupation of Armenian territories, 
then it would be a great help from the EU side. Thank you, Mr. Pagosian. Uh, Ms. Avkhledyani, Georgia is also a small country. Uh, what could uh, uh, this uh, format, uh, uh, Eastern Partnership, uh, uh, what could it do uh, about uh, Georgia uh, in addition? Sure. I think um, what the, the events we're witnessing right now, as I already said, Georgia was already in this game and Georgia has already paid its price. And what we are witnessing now, furthermore, is the unity of Georgian people. They're taking streets to show their, their solidarity with the Ukrainians. Uh, and I think this is quite telling um, itself as the events unfold. So the, for, for sure, from the EU standpoint, given Georgia's progress on association agreement, um, this should be the prerequisite for the Georgia Georgia's membership perspectives uh, in the European Union. Although um, I should stay here, like not biased, and mention that we witnessed um, Georgia's democratic clamping, I mean, clamp down on Georgia's democratic reforms, uh, reforms recently. However, we should mention that this um, is against the will of Georgian people, who are demonstrating already for years, and uh, implementation of the association agreement is still going ahead. So this still creates hopes that until it's very late, the EU could use this momentum together with Moldova. Moldova uh, to bring the associated trio countries together and to basically define the membership perspectives for, for them together, because they've been here uh, from the very beginning uh, when they, they, they all uh, pay their price. Obviously, the price of Ukraine is much more scale, uh, much larger scale. Uh, well, Ukraine is today, as we are witnessing, paying Ukrainian people are paying with their blood for the, for the candidacy in the, in, the, in the European Union. Um, but this should refer to the other countries as well, who are uh, the allies. And if I could add here uh, just very briefly on the sanctions. What we could witness these days is that this is a true partnership between the European Union and its eastern, member, its eastern neighbors because the partnership that affects the both. It's not only the EU who's been shaping the future of the eastern partnership countries, but what we see now is Ukraine is the eastern neighbors which are shaping the EU's decision making and bringing the union closer together, closer than ever. So this is basically the definition of the partnership that we should be talking today about. Thank you. Uh, do you have something to add, Mr. Bondra, following the discussion? Okay. We just today has adopted a resolution in the European Parliament, which uh, uh, somehow positively react to uh, the request by uh, President Zelensky to offer the uh, to offer the candidate status to Ukraine. Um, uh, that's, I think, and it's a very important symbolic event that. Uh, you know, we are open, uh, but, uh, you know, what is the most important is that your, Ukraine must, uh, must survive as an independent state. And this is now what we are all fighting about, you know. <laughs> and uh, this, uh, you know, everything depends how this will end up. And there are, you know, I can imagine... Uh, the various uh, possibilities uh, of, of the result of this. Uh, I also share the opinion of Vito that, you know, the, the immediate collapse of the Russian Empire is rather unlikely in uh, the foreseeable uh, future. Um, then, you know, the, 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 the dictate for all of us is to do everything that Ukraine would uh, survive as a sovereign independent state. And it will be very difficult because for those who are listening this Putin speech uh, last Monday, which framed the re rush resonator of this his, uh, aggression, uh, he has just one uh, goal to, to, uh, to, to regain the Russian empire and he does not recognize Ukraine, neither as a state nor as a nation. Uh, you know, this uh, speech with the brutality of uh, his war goals will enter into history, as well as our common response to this criminal act. Yeah. Uh, so now it's about the war. What it's the not about the institution building. What is the threat for a whole European Union after the Russian <clears throat> invasion in Ukraine, Mr. Wojciechowski? Well, let me remind you that some years ago, Putin mentioned publicly that collapse of the Soviet Union was the biggest strategy. 
in the history of Russia. This year he will celebrate 100 years of creation of the Soviet Union. So he wants to regain for Russia, of course, the, the power, the strength of the former Soviet Union. Now, he is claiming not only to dominate the former Soviet republics like Belarus, Ukraine, or Kazakhstan, he is uh, asking, he is claiming to dominate also in near abroad, in the central part. Let's, uh, let me remind you again that one of his um, ministers mentioned that uh, the process of NATO enlargement is supposed to go back to 1997. So the countries like Poland supposed to, according to this wish, and claim to become non-member of European, non-member of NATO, non-member of European Union, without the deployment of the of the foreign troops, uh, NATO troops on the territory of the eastern flank. The next claim came yesterday about the nuclear uh, posture, and let me remind you again that for several years, uh, Belarusian forces, together with Russian forces, during the Zapad maneuvers. They were exercising a military strike together with nuclear strike against Warsaw. So we can expect everything actually from the guy who has a, who is possessed with power to dominate and come back to 1960s, 70s when Soviet gensecs were equal to the uh, U.S. presidents. Thank you, uh, Mr. Movchan. Um... We uh, follow the situation uh, every day and every hour in, in Ukraine. There is a, a mobilization, uh, but uh, uh, most probably the people are very exhausted from uh, all these uh, uh, attacks. Uh, what, what's coming next? Uh, uh, there, there is a motivation for sure, but uh, is this enough? We lost connection with Veronica Movchan. Is she back, uh, Ms. Movchan? Uh, you can, you, you are able to hear us. Uh, I was, yes, uh, I was talking about the the, the nowadays situation uh, in uh, uh, Kiev and uh, all the other uh, big cities in Ukraine. There is a mobilization uh, of the men's population, uh, and uh, they are. Uh, very motivated uh, to to defend uh, their uh, cities and their country, as we see from the TV reports. Uh, uh, what else? What else can uh, can you tell us? Uh, uh, how would you describe the situation in this field? Yeah, but that, that's what uh, you said. That's absolutely correct. The uh, the mobilized uh, people, the army is very. Uh, uh, motivated but we also have territorial defense that is the people who are not like suit for the army who are not trade for the army they are forming the uh, the forces to defend their communities of their cities in in large and small villages and actually it's not only these forces we have a lot of volunteers who are supporting the army and doing the fights I, uh, and we have a lot of already very heroic stories that the people just simple people civilians without any weapon uh stopping the tanks by molotov cocktails or like blocking the streets so it's actually the whole country is is fighting and it's very clear that the, it's a fight for for, for our survival it's 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 they they want us not to exist they want to kill us so it's 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 no no other option than to fight but and there yeah, have been a negotiation uh, uh, there have been a peaceful negotiations uh, uh, yesterday uh, what is your prognosis how how do you uh, see uh, the chances the, of these uh, uh, peace uh, talks I don't think um, here. I am economist, so it's my uh, more like personal opinion. But uh, I don't think that it's a clear like 
victor of any one of the party who that can make the uh, negotiations decisive. As far as I know, uh, Russia repeated the same or very similar claims that has existed that Ukraine has uh, to accept Crimea, has to accept Donbass and Lugansk in the uh, borders of oblast, so give up the territories controlled by Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine has to be demilitarized, Ukraine has to be federalized, etc. So Russia actually repeated uh, the same claims, basically the same claims it had before. It's uh, Regretfully, it's not a peaceful talks, it's the same uh, claims we heard before war started. Are you going to stay in Kiev? No matter what happens, or you you uh, try to to find uh, uh, a safer way for you. Uh, yeah, basically now I'm already not in Kiev, uh, so I, I moved because of, of my family. Uh, but I know that a lot of my friends are still in Kiev. It's uh, we have, as I said, it was split. Some people will move, try to move, especially people with small children or old parents, they try to leave Kiev because they are not very helpful there. They only can be used as victims or somebody who can be a threat. But many people joined, uh, also in our office, people joined uh, the military force or territorial uh, security forces to defend Kiev and uh, they are fighting. Others are fighting like... Uh, with uh, some cyber attacks who can do that mm -hmm. or with uh, volunteer support or finding helping people to find shelter. Actually, it's, it's a lot of uh, process now in the country. We learned it a bit because we had already 2014, then after Maidan, Russia attacked, and then Ukrainian army was completely unprepared for such an event. And then uh, it was a lot of people uh, who went to the army or to the war with Russia in Donbass to stop them before the army was like, reshaped in the build. Now, luckily, we have much better army, but still the it is a national for, war for us. It's a war for the whole country, for the whole nation, and all, most of participate in their places where they can. Some are actively fighting, some are financially supporting, some are helping cook food or do whatever they can. We are going now to uh, to the end of our program. Uh, what are your uh, final remarks uh, or your closing words? Uh, uh, let's start with you. Sure. Uh, I think the most important is now that we we show our support to Ukrainian people who are bravely, bravely standing there, all the civilians, all the military, uh, the president and his excellent team. Um, so we extend our, our best wishes with them and we, we hope that Ukraine stands strong. Um, the other message goes to the European Union and to its Western allies to make sure they can do all to increase Ukraine's resilience, to sanction further Russia, whatever it costs. Uh, the Western allies to really sanction the uh, Putin and to sanction every revenue it still funds its military invasion of Ukraine. Thank you, Ms. Okledyani. Mr. Bogusian? What are your final remarks? What else do you want to add to the, this discussion? Again, I would like to once again as the process of the Eastern Partnership has been starting from the pushing uh, same approach to everyone, that all uh, leaders who initiated war would be punished in equal way. Uh, Aliyev president, as well as Erdogan, would be punished and sanctions also in the same way. Sanctions wouldn't be coming just because someone's name Armenian and someone's name is different others but it would be the same similar approach. And by this, the real value system would continue because we are talking now about choice of civilization. And if there is a choice on the civil approach and be part of the family, then the approaches to the desire of all should be uh, in a same similar way 
uh, showed and not just once to have a, a selective approach in one case and selective approach in another case. This is, I think, one of the biggest lessons that we're learning now. And as we are standing now at the geopolitical changes in the world, we perfectly need to understand what kind of a move should be in a policy for not allowing that dividing lines would be simply by choice of uh, security, but be a uh, choice by uh, civilization and value. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Pogosian. Mr. Vondra. I think that we need to do the three things. First, to help the Ukrainians by all available means, so shipping the uh, weapons there, shipping uh, the money, shipping the humanitarian aid. Uh, that's number one. Number two, to tighten for the, the sanctions against Russia. Uh, there are still some banks which are not included in into SWIFT, so we can do more. And thirdly, we must continue to uh, to, um, to 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 make stronger defense of the eastern flank of NATO, in particular the Baltic states, Poland, Hungary, those uh, uh, Romania, all those uh, let's say frontline uh, states. So those three things must be done in an orchestra and even more intensive way than was done until today. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vondra. Uh, Ms. Movchan. Yeah, finally, thank you. I what, do... Uh, what do you want to say finally uh, to, to this discussion? Thank you. First of all, I want to thank again all European partners and also partners in US and UK and Japan and all other worlds who joined the sanctions and helping Ukraine in its fight. As of a Further steps, what else can be done? A part of this military and humanitarian support, definitely sanctions against Russia should be strengthened to the point that the not only that the people feel that 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 something has to be changed. And also we need uh, to like help. Ukrainians to feel that they are they are not alone in this. The uh, probably it can this uh, this step of membership candidacy is a great and this is one of the the most strength strengthened uh, messages that EU can do. Uh, just probably we should not now put it into this uh, frame that it is like uh, now fulfill criteria but support by a political perspective to be uh, to give a clear sign for what people are fighting and technically one of the greatest thing that we have to rethink all together is the energy security of the globe because uh, Russia power is built on the energy power and the portals of energy. So the, here we can return to this issue of climate that we fully forgot today. And I'm very thankful for that we forgot climate and talk about Ukraine. But then thinking about sanctions, energy and climate can work together, bringing us also to the brighter future of the whole globe and Europe and Ukraine. And we will fight. That's the only way we can survive and there's the only way we can do now. We are in the war. Thank you. Thank you Ms. for Mokhtan. your support. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, Mr. Wojcikowski, your final words. Uh, what is the uh, European par uh, perspective for all these countries uh, in the Eastern Partnership, uh, bearing in mind uh, their uh, problems uh, with Russia? Uh, that will not uh, disappear overnight? Well, we discuss this uh, overall picture, we discuss sanctions, we discuss opening of uh, the process of enlargement, candidacy process and other things. One thing is missing which needs to be organized immediately, which, which is one? humanitarian assistance. The war lasts already five days. In the big cities like uh, Kiev, this is more than three million people. In a day or two, they will start suffering uh, 
a shortage of food, shortage of water, gas, with the uh, advance of, uh, of military front. Of course, Russians are becoming to destroy not only military uh, facilities, but they are bombing just civilian facilities. So we have to start thinking about the humanitarian corridors. We have to start thinking about the humanitarian bridges, uh, air bridges to, to deliver food. And let uh, me remind that only Poland received, accepted already almost 400,000 people from Ukraine. So far we can provide them food and shelter. But uh, for the longer distance, uh, we have to organize the normal life for them. We have to send um, children to school. We have to send uh, uh, older people to, to the job market. So this is the, the big um, task for the European Union, not only to fight, not only to rebuild Ukraine, but also to give immediate relief for these people who are suffering. Humanitarianly. Yes. Uh, well, this is uh, uh, this is going to be a big process. How long will it take, according to you? Well, I don't want to look at the bad examples, but you know the Palestinians are waiting since the Second World War, almost seven, eight years. Crimea is occupied for, for eight years, also Donbas. Um, if we are not be able to, to support Ukraine, to defend themselves and to regain these occupied territories, well, we have to be prepared for years of humanitarian assistance. This is unacceptable in the middle of Europe, uh, this kind of situation. Is, is Europe uh, ready to, to, face, uh, to face this issue? must be ready. This is one of the richest parts of the world. So if we redirect our policy, we stop thinking about the climate change, we are going to be sooner killed by Iskander missile, by the smoke made of burning coal. So we have to think about the real problems, not some, uh, some kind of a uh, fanaberries, I would say, or, or, or exercises which, uh, which are based on some kind of a, um, I, uh, uh, idealistic or maybe ideological ideas. We have to start uh, put our foot on the, on the ground and start thinking in a realistic way. Thank you very much uh, for your participation in uh, this uh, discussion, Ms. Akhledyani, uh, Mr. Woszczykowski, Mr. Vondra, Ms. Movchan. Uh, anybody uh, wants to add something? Uh, Mr. Vondra, please go ahead. Yeah, maybe, maybe to add one small thing, uh, which uh, you know would not swim uh, in, in our joint orchestra, because I think that we are in all agreement. But I think that uh, heading into this uh, kind of a more real politic world, we should also be able to use the real politic weapons against Putin, not just our classic one. And in particular, if the United States and the NATO allies are not willing to engage in a war with Russia because it's a nuclear power, and I think that his uh, nuclear threats just two days ago was a direct response to uh, the idea of uh, building a no-fly zone over the Ukraine, that there is a direct linkage. So we should try to engage China. Yeah? Uh, remember what Nixon did with Kissinger in early 70s, when the United States, in the middle of the Cold War, were playing shorthanded against uh, against the Brezhnev Soviet Union, being weakened by the 60s, by the Vietnam, and by all those, uh, all those challenges. Uh, we in the European Parliament are uh, having, uh, you know, we have this uh, uh, economic agreement uh, with China, which, uh, you know, we put uh, on hold uh, because of some, uh, some specific issues. Maybe, you know, to try to approach China to further isolate Putin. 
But this is, you know, a kind of a different thinking what uh, the thinking which I was used to uh, to uh, to operate in the last 30 years. So, but, you know, that's a different world now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Vondra. Thank you. Thank all of you for sharing your views with us. Uh, uh, Mr. Pogusian, thank you very much as well for taking part in our discussion. Uh, now we are going to, uh, to the end of uh, uh, this uh, studio today, but uh, we'll be with you uh, tomorrow morning uh, at uh, 10 o'clock uh, um, with our next uh, discussion. See you tomorrow at 10 a.m. Varmt välkomna till Stockholm och SER-gruppens turné för framtidens Europa. We started this ECR vision of Europe's future already six months ago. And we did it with one intention. Make sure that every citizen of each member state knows that there is an alternative future for European Union. Ja, det är ju mycket som händer nu både i Sverige och i Europa och övriga omvärlden. Vi står inför stora utmaningar både vad gäller migration, organiserad brottslighet och ekonomin och den rådande pandemin. The fact is that we in the ECR group are the true supporters of Europe because Europe does not mean or at least should not mean a centralized bureaucratic set of institutions. Europe should describe the great variety of nations that make our continent such a vibrant and significant place. A future that doesn't create conflict between friends and allies and a future that protects tradition, values and national identities. In short, the noble idea of the founding fathers of uniting the nations of Europe in a community of cooperation had been forgotten and replaced with an attempt to build a centralized superstate. Vår vision för Europa den präglas av starka nationella demokratier med ett stort medborgarinflytande. Där varje nation ska avgöra sin egen framtid och även de minsta nationernas egenskaper och unika kulturer ska respekteras. Är det EU vi har idag verkligen så demokratiskt? som man vill att det ska vara. That the diversity of opinions for example is one of our continent's greatest strengths. But we see little spaces for free speech of different points of view in many of the big debates in Brussels. A Europe that is not listening to its citizens cannot be strong, not inside Europe itself and also not internationally. Verder is denk ik nodig dat we het takenpakket van de Europese Unie heel goed afbaken. De Europese Unie moet zich alleen bezighouden met grensoverschrijdende onderwerpen. Bijvoorbeeld handel en migratie. Inom eh, invandringsområdet där vi definitivt ska bestämma det eh, själva hemma i vårt land. Vad vi klarar av och vad vi inte klarar av. Så att, nej, jag, jag ser eh, alltså det, det går på fel håll. Man har stora ambitioner och den konservativa rösten den behövs mer än någonsin. Och... Så so i det här är det första som jag skulle säga att EU måste komma med en plan för att stoppa not only on documents but in reality with actions to stop the human smugglers to have negotiated return policy with third countries to stop the boats from departing. Och där även de här mer vänsterliberala partierna ändå fick upp ögonen för att det finns en gräns för vad vi klarar. Vi har ju sagt det länge. Så förstår jag att vi behöver ha samarbeten eftersom vi ändå har en yttre gräns och så. Så tycker jag det är viktigt att vi gör gemensam sak för att, att hålla den gränsen. Vi ser ju samarbetet i Europa som självklart. Samarbeta kring handel, samarbeta kring eh, miljöproblem som ju inte känner några gränser. Det är svårt att bekämpa miljöproblem bara i ett enskilt mm. land. Eh, internationellt organiserad brottslighet är också en sån sak där vi måste samarbeta och där EU fyller en funktion.
kriminaliteten som tyvärr ökar för oss nu mycket tack vare, eller tack vare på grund av att vi har den fria rörligheten inom EU och bristande gränskontroller. Och det här har gjort att vi ser en ökad gränsöverskridande kriminalitet i Sverige, vapensmuggling och så vidare. Och även tullen har ju en väldigt viktig roll som skulle kunna göra mycket mer än vad de kan göra idag. Man låser sitt hem om natten därför att man hatar alla människor som finns utanför en hem. Man låser ju sitt hem om natten därför att man älskar sitt hem och framförallt därför att man älskar de människor som finns inuti det här hemmet. Lösningen är det att vi alla tar ansvar som nationer genom att stärka våra respektive länders rättsväsenden och använda det som en utgångspunkt för samarbetet. Vi behöver ju brida hela EU-projektet tillbaka till grunderna och grunderna är ju egentligen den inre marknaden, fri handel, fri rörlighet av, av varor och tjänster och kapital och så vidare. Det, det är liksom grunden. I Europas länder har hittills haft ett bra samarbete sinsemellan utan överstatlighet och utan att Bryssel har lagt sig. Varför ska vi gå ifrån ett fungerande koncept genom att ge mer makt och centralisering till EU? Our idea is to stimulate a new debate, to offer a new hope for Europe, to discuss ways we can put our national democracies back at the heart of the European idea. Europa jest dobrem wspólnym. Różnimy się, ale powinno nas łączyć wspólne dziedzictwo. Powróćmy do Unii Europejskiej, która z tego dziedzictwa wyrasta i która szanuje narodowe tożsamości. Only the European Union without arrogance, based on solidarity and mutual respect for its member states, can regain the support of the European nations. We can do it together.